Hoping that I've got in the audience here Liam Burns and that he's going to come up to the front in a second. Liam is, uh, as you can see from the programme here, President of the National Union of Students and Liam's going to talk to us uh, for 10 minutes about learner-led feedback mechanisms. Colleagues, please put your hands together and welcome Liam to the stage. Uh, thank you very much and good morning everyone. As uh, has been said, my name is uh, Liam Burns and I'm uh, the National President um, of the National Union of Students. And can I just start by thanking you for having me today. Um, there are really uncertain times ahead in terms of the FE sector and I'm proud to say that NUS remains at the forefront of those debates, the key discussions, and we're currently trying our best to be at the forefront of putting the learner voice at the centre of how we have a discussion around post-compulsory education. Uh, I'm also really pleased to say that I'm actually the first NUS president to address this conference. Um, had my pre predecessors realised just how adept the colleagues in this room would be at sweeping up the wine bottles that I saw last night, then I'm sure that would not indeed by the, be the case. Uh, in fact, a colleague came up to me just as I sat down and said, um, being today as it is Red Nose Day, I thought you'd walk in with a red nose. I said, seeing how much drink there was last night, I thought other colleagues would as well, but nonetheless, I'll put that to one side. But it is meaningful, and it's meaningful for two reasons. Um, I come as an NUS president who um, previously was president of NUS Scotland, where 90% of my time was spent on campaigning to try and assert part of a steam between the college and the university sector to try and really challenge the idea that the Scottish government could get away with cuts to college, uh, co uh, the college sector and bursaries in the college sector in Scotland. And I come at a time when NUS itself has put colleges in the FE sector at the forefront of its campaigning. Whether it's our research into student financial support and trying to address the disgraceful, uh, disproportionate investment in subsidy to HE students and student financial support which such low subsidy comes to FE students, whether it's about an independent complaints commission for FE students, or whether it's about challenging both the social and indeed economic wisdom of loans in FE, we are taking this stuff seriously. And again, I want to give another example of how we take that so seriously. Uh, as many would know, usually it would be the Vice President of Further Education that addressed this conference, but Tony Pierce, who is our Vice President of Further Education, can't make it, and for very good reason and that she's currently roaming the country campaigning to be the next national president of NUS. I think that's amazing, that she's amazing, and finally, we're trying to assert that a student leader of the national movement shouldn't just be the preserve of the university sector. And you know, if you were to go back to your college and, uh, and make sure that you have delegates coming to our national conference, you might be meddling in our democracy, but I wouldn't mind that so much. I'm incredibly proud of her, and I'd be incredibly proud if she succeeded me as national president. There's three things that I want to cover today. First of all, why I think it's time for a funda fundamental debate on how post-compulsory education should be reimagined and why with students, you people should be at the front of that debate. I want to cover why I think you are in danger of letting us down. And finally, I want to discuss why the people in this room are so amazing, why our students are so grateful for the work that you do and why you make such a difference to students' lives. I'd like to call that a well-rounded presentation. You might well call it a shit sandwich. That's right, <laughs> we know those tricks as well. <laughs> um, so let me first give you a, an example. Being the president of the National Union of Students, um, particularly in our 91st year, is often an extraordinary job. Um, one minute you can be in a room like this, giving your opinion of the impact of the new era, indeed as our uh, the title of our conference demands. Uh, the next, you're replying, and I mean this uh, in a genuine way, I've not made this up, you're replying to a letter to one of our seven million members who have a, uh, who have a particular interest, issue or gripe that they expect you to deal with. And a year or so ago, I had a letter that was particularly striking in this vein. In the morning, I'd had a meeting with the, the then Skills Minister, John Hayes, someone I think we're, we all appreciate how committed to the sector he was, um, and he had been talking about the value of vocational education and, and part of esteem in that regard. But then in the afternoon, I was reading an email from a high-achieving, talented business and administrative apprentice who had been told by every single UK university 
that she'd, appro uh, that she'd approached for entry that they wouldn't touch her with a barge pole because she hadn't opted to do A-levels. This happens a lot. Many people I speak to in this job are baffled by the seven million figure in terms of our membership and often assume that I'd somehow misjudged the size of the Russell Group. When in truth, my role advocates for the interests of learners in HE and FE, universities and colleges, classroom classics and work-based work learners, even public and private institutions. And in that multi-sector soup, we do an awful lot of sorting. Right from the flawed assumptions about sorting young people into those who are good with their hands and those who are good with their heads, to the sieving of university applications by A-level points, or the sorting of graduate recruitment, um, but, uh, graduate recruitment scheme applicants to those who went to Oxford and those who went to Oxford Brookes. Our post-16 system is riddled with strange assumptions that do us absolutely no good in the modern age. The press and politicians do us no help in this regard. The press are beset with moral and classic panic and our politicians are enthralled to markets and marginals in a way that combines into a deeply unhelpful way when it comes to HE or post-16 education. We're left with hollow nostrums like striving for world-class skills or lazy arguments about too many or too few. As a country, we obsessively rank our universities and colleges and compulsively ignore our FE sector. All these things, like liberal versus vocational, further education versus higher education, colleges versus universities, traditional versus modern, full-time versus part-time, I could go on and on all morning. These old and tired debates fill up too much of our thinking time. They're quite frankly boring, and they do little work for us anymore. What I want to do briefly this morning is argue that the idea of a truly tertiary education system allows us to shatter these false oppositions and the false boundaries between them. Of course, there's a hard-nosed argument to this. It makes no sense politically when year after year, general election after general election, we as the National Union of Students are forced into really false, false debates about cap, how high, when it comes to our universities, about loans for apprentices and actually asking people to work for us and take out a loan to do so, about Victorian assorting um, of A-levels and qualifications that Michael Gove would expect us to engage with. I make no apology for saying that when we have colleagues on this platform trying to espouse that the idea of asking a loan for level three qualifications is somehow an opportunity for different types of learners, I think we really need to challenge how we structure our tertiary education system. Uh, so first, I want to talk about an idea, something that's big, something that's bold, something that I can't boil down to a campaign, a manifesto, a single policy initiative, an idea. And that idea is tertiary education. It's not a term that's in vogue, it's not a term that invokes much sympathy or understanding, at least not in England. But for me, we can use the term tertiary to challenge the educational structures and policies that hold people back and put artificial barriers in their way. So what do I mean by that? Well, there shouldn't, for example, be a presumption that vocational training and work in the real world is somehow inadequate preparation for academic courses. As I said earlier, Having heard from talented apprentices whom leading universities won't touch because they don't have A-levels, that sort of thing is pure snobbery and it's absolutely counterproductive, both socially and economically. What else might tertiary mean? Well, our system here in England post-16 is hugely unforgiving of mistakes, especially when those mistakes are made by young people. If they get something wrong, or they take a risk, or in Michael Gove's vision, have a bad exam day, they can be literally written off at the age of 16. The system is a recipe for playing at safe attitudes, low on imagination, and low on lateral thinking. The cliff face of five A to C's at GCSE was always bad enough, but many of the people in your colleges now face a new frontier of missing out on those vital A, B, A, B, 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 whatever it will be next year, A-level grades that present an unbearably perilous 
at new cliff face, a whole new raft of learners be encouraged to play it safe. Choosing a diverse mix of subjects or just attempting something ambitious or quirky or stretching or not quite making it or choosing English and history and combining it with something vocational at 16 to 18, these are all really bad ideas in the new political economy that is application to lifelong learning. We do well to stop seeing education progression as linear, where we only either move up the scale of educational values. Why not further education after higher education? Why not the two at exactly the same time? Our international student officer last year at NUS, who came from China herself, came to the UK to study at postgraduate level with an undergraduate degree and a college business study qualification that she studied for at the same time. Is it really beyond us to enable people in this country to study a history degree and a BTEC in management diploma at the same time? Because I assure you, other countries, other economies, and other societies don't believe so. The idea of tertiary, a truly coherent post-compulsory 16 education system, is important in saying something about our ambition for education, not just post-compulsory, but all-encompassing. It has been estimated that all of our education spending, only 15% is spent on people over the age of 24. As this century progresses, and as we all live, long, uh, live longer, this starts to look incredibly wrong. We should try to imagine a future in which four in every five people have a direct stake in tertiary education, participating in it, using it throughout their lives, with the funding and the time to benefit from it in full. That would be a system that we could truly call universal, like our health system is universal. This is about education meeting people's needs from nursery to old age. The debate I hate most, I, I take this on board personally myself, that, that floats around uh, the, the national conference of, of NUS, is this daft idea that you can somehow counterpose education for education's sake versus education for employment. I mean, it's bad enough that the former is usually espoused by those who are almost certainly guaranteed to walk into a highly paid graduate scheme in an investment bank. But it's certainly not a debate that does our society much good. It's stale and it's false. And that's because education can be about both things and more. Now, I'm not saying that we need to abandon all institutional forms or categories or modes. I'm not saying that there's no meaningful distinction of complexity, difficulty or risk in the different types of education we have in the UK. I'm not saying that there's no meaningful distinction between, say, higher education and those other forms of education that we deem to be less advanced. Being a barrister is not the same as being a legal clerk. Both require distinct blends of knowledge and skill, but one is recognizably more advanced than the other. At the same time, the phrase becoming a painter could mean painter as in painter and decorator, or it could mean fine artist. These are related vocations. In fact, they both probably involved an apprenticeship in some form, but they are differentially advanced and they are addressing different codes of knowledge and skill. And part of my assertion is that it might be desirable at some point during early adulthood for a person to be both a successful barrister and a handy painter and decorator. Imagine that. What I'm saying is that lots of the differences we cling to between education at different levels of complexity are barely recognizable in a structural and institutional sense and certainly will not be recognizable in 20 years' time. I wonder sometimes what the debate on post-compulsory education would look like if we give people in this room the space that they felt that they had the space to question the parameters of the current system rather than always being subjected to them. Our members want and deserve to have such a debate. And my plea is that people in this room, be them principals and governors, have a responsibility to give them the space to have that debate. So that's what I mean by my first point on what tertiary education could look like. Not a campaign or a manifesto or an objective or a policy, but an idea. An idea 
whose time has come. Okay. Um, that is problematic, but nonetheless, you will be used to seeing officers who speak far too long, so I'll try my best to wrap up. Um, I want an education that can do all of these things. Secondly, I wanted to talk to you about culture and governance. Um, I'm going to be purposely patronising. I'm going to be challenging. Um, and that's because we don't often get, and I'm so grateful to have platforms like this to do so. I'm conscious that the government has been pursuing an agenda of freedoms for colleges that places you in a very similar legal footing to universities. As you know, we had a fight to keep student membership of your corporations. And over the past few months, some of you have reduced the number of student governors from two to one. When we asked why, we received feedback from our friends in the Clerk Network that some colleges have changed uh, form from two to one just because they can. Some of you don't support proper students' unions in your colleges because you don't have to. Some of you now select rather than elect your student reps because freedoms let you. Well, for th those that that apply to, I'd simply say this, be careful. Just because you are free to do these things doesn't mean you should. Colleges have always been the difficult middle child. Because you don't have a curfew anymore doesn't mean you should stay out all night. Take our view on complaints. Universities, the bastion of freedom and autonomy, backed enthusiastically a robust and independent complaints adjudicator so that when something goes wrong, students are protected. Three years ago, the Association of Colleges backed our calls for a similar body in FE, but now have slinked away from it, saying that colleges want and need their freedom. Freedom to do what? Ignore complaints? Freedom to cover up failings? Freedom to let students down? The thing about freedom is, you are free to help us set up a proper complaints, complaints regulator if you want, or you're free to let us down. Like I said, having a curfew doesn't mean you get to stay out all night. We have lots of challenges in the college sector. One of them is treating our learners uh, as, chi as children and acting in a, p a paternalistic nature. My plea to every governor in this room is to go back and shine a spotlight on this area. You have the freedom to define success, to ask really important questions about what does your learner engagement survey say, about what do students ask in terms of the learning and teaching curriculum. You have the freedom to define success, stretching targets around involvement in student enrichment activity, real investment in extracurricular activities. Elected student leaders and vibrant student unions are not a, a luxury, they're a necessity. And I will just say this, uh, realising I'm going to be kicked off this stage imminently. I stand before you as an NUS president who came from the higher education background. I stood against a colleague, Shane Chowen, who came from the further education sector. The reason he got to stand in that election was because Cornwall College spent the time investing in a student's union that didn't just value what you said and we did cultures in, in bed in our, in, our, in our colleges. It invested in something that was about active citizenship about recognising that we're not just here to teach young people. You people in this room, as I said earlier, are changing people's lives. Not because of the curriculum you deliver, but because of the type of people you get to engage with day in, day out. If you're going to decry the fact that we don't have enough politicians who come from uh, vocational backgrounds, if you're rightly going to challenge that we don't have enough sector leaders that know the college inside out, then that responsibility is on your doorstep. Because if you think that you can do learner engagement simply by sending out surveys, rather than engaging young people to be active leaders, rather than developing mature students to be people who have an, a role in, in citizenship and a leadership role in our society, then that's not our fault, that's yours. We're about to have someone stand for national president of the National Union of Students, and an incredibly important part of civic society who comes from a college background because her college invested in her as a leader. And so I will finish on this. We're about to have the first college president in our 91 years of history potentially elected as president of this organisation. My question is this, what would you like your time as a governor or a principal of a college to look like? Could it be about questioning the big picture of the debate of what post-compulsory education should look like? Could it be about challenging that we shouldn't fail young people to become 
somehow marginalized in a culture of consumerism and treating learners as people that we ask an opinion of rather than letting them lead their own education? Could your time be about celebrating your place in taking tertiary education and allowing those most disenfranchised in our society to really thrive? I think the answer to all those things is yes. And for that reason, on behalf of seven million students across the UK, I thank you for all the work that you do, and hopefully we can work together in the future. Thank you.